That's great, Yolanda. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Yolanda Nguanzo, and I work for the USDA based out of Tumwater, Washington. Um, and I'm going to um, show you a few priority pests. And um, by priority pests, what, what I mean, I, you know, different people might mean different things um, with the word priority pests, but I, I work in a program called CAPS, which stands for Cooperative Agriculture Pest Survey. And um, it's, it's kind of a, a funding source, but it's also a community, um, a lot of resources go into researching pests and researching the best way to survey for them, researching which pests um, should be prioritized because they are they would be impactful if they were to come uh, to North America. And there's a pathway, they're at risk of coming to North America. There's hosts available for them to um, get established. And also very importantly, there's a good survey method. If there's no good survey method, um, the program doesn't really want to spend money surveying for um, for a pest if the you know if the survey really isn't a good way to you know there's no really good way to survey for it. So all these things go into um, making the decision of which pests are going to be on the priority pest list. And um, um, yeah, just uh, PPQ mission is to safeguard U.S. agriculture, but also natural resources that in that includes um, native plants and forests, um, and uh, so preventing the entry. So um, through the through the ports, through the airport, the seaports, um, passenger baggage, all of these things are inspected to prevent pests from coming in. But then, if they do come in, um, PPQ attempts to prevent the establishment and the spread to new areas. Um, and as I said, CAPS, Cooperative Agriculture Pest Survey, has a website. Um, and this website is available to the public. Um, anybody can look at the materials that are on here. And there's a lot of really good, useful information. Um, I'll give the, the web address of this website, but anytime you want to contact me, if you have any questions about it, um, feel free. The CAPS mission is to conduct pest surveys, um, but also kind of establishing a national network of cooperators and stakeholders, um, local governments, um, you know, different states um, to work together to protect agriculture and natural resources. Here's the web address for CAPS. Um, and again, just contact me if you want me to send this to you. I'm, I'm happy to um, you know, answer any questions or share any of this material with you. So in order to become a CAPS priority pest, um, there's some criteria because USDA with limited funding, they don't wanna spend a lot of funds um, to survey for pests that might not be important or that it might there might not be a good survey method for them. So the pest must be predicted to have a high impact in the United States um, or interfere with trade. It must be exotic. Once a pest has already been introduced and is established, it, it gets taken off of the priority pest list. Um, again, as I said before, there has to be a proven reliable and effective pest detection method. Um, and the methods and resources must be available. So if, you know, if there's a lure, but the lure is hard to purchase, it's not available, then um, it's not a good, you know, a good pest that we should be surveying for. There must be a good diagnostic method. There are some pests that are so difficult to diagnose that even if a surveyor, you know, collects some samples that they want to have diagnosed, there's, it's, you know, it's difficult to do that. So um, it, it's counterproductive to spend money surveying for things like that. And pests are removed from the priority pest list if they've been federally deregulated or they've already become established in multiple states. Here's the um, one of the pages that's really useful if you want to look into this yourself. Um, again, feel free, I can send you a link to this page. Um, down below here, all of the priority pests are listed and you can sort them in alphabetical order by scientific name or common name. And then over here, there's a link um, that if you click on it, it'll take you to the um, a pest data sheet that has like all of the most important information that you would want to know about the pest, um, descriptions, pictures, um, 
the hosts that it feeds on. And, you know, sometimes when we say host, what we're really meaning is um, for an insect is of what is it, where, what is it eating and where is it living? A lot of insects will live in the plant that they're eating. So um, we use the, the word host. Um, so this is really useful information because if you know the host, then you know where you should look for it. Or if you know the host, you know, if you see some damage on these hosts, it might be this pest. Um, the survey method is also on the pest data sheet. Sometimes it's a trap, but sometimes it's just um, visual, you know, looking for signs and symptoms. Um, I have some pictures here of some examples of, of the uh, traps that are sometimes used for pest surveys. Another function of the CAPS program is um, researching what's the best way to trap, what's the best survey method, what's um, the best way to trap for an insect. And this is an example of a gypsy moth trap, which uses the pest biology um, for you know, how, to, how to place it on the trunk of the tree where it would be most effective. These are other examples of, of traps. And these are all science-based methods that um, you know, research goes into figuring out what's the best configuration and design of a, of a trap um, for it to be most effective. There's another example of a, of a different trap for a different species. Here's an example of a trap that's often used for um, wood boring pests that might burrow into the trunk of a tree. And this takes advantage of the pest behavior. Um, they look for a, you know, a dark vertical surface um, like a tree trunk. So the, the organisms that are on the priority pest list um, include all of these things, insects, plant diseases, nematodes, plants, which are would be noxious weeds, and mollusks, um, snails, and slugs. So I'm going to go through just, um, I just came up with a short list of a few um, um, specific pests on the priority pest list that might be um, like really distinctive, something that'd be easy to see. The survey method for these pests that I'm going to show you, this uh, just a small list. The survey method is all visual survey, so not trapping or um, any kind of sampling or anything like that, just visual survey. These are things to be on the lookout, and these are things that are not known to occur in Washington. So if you see them, um, early detection would be very important. It would be great if you could call someone, call your extension, your WSDA um, office or your USDA office. This is um, horse thistle. And um, it looks like a thistle, but it doesn't really have a stem. It kind of lays flat to the ground. Um, another one is um, Scott's blister rust, Cronardium flexidum. Um, this is the list of hosts that it um, can be on. And one of them is pine. Um, this is uh, kind of what it looks like in, in one phase of its life cycle. Asian longhorn beetle is something that we're always at risk of, of getting in Washington. Um, it has been introduced to other states in the Eastern United States. Um, the adult has a really distinctive look. It's pretty large. Um, we have species that look similar to this, but um, this is different from those in that the um, it's it's really shiny. It looks kind of like patent leather instead of a kind of more a dull, which our native beetles have. Um, it's black with white dots. Um, sometimes you really won't see the actual insect, but you might see signs of its feeding damage or signs that it has infested a tree. One of those signs are these um, shallow divots where it lays eggs, and the exit hole you might notice here. It's perfectly round. It almost looks like it was made by a drill. If you see anything like this in a hardwood tree, um, it would be great if you could take a picture and send it to us, send it to someone, either your extension office or USDA or WSDA office. Here are the preferred hosts of Asian longhorn beetle, maple, buckeye, birch, willow, and elm. It has a lot of other hosts, but these are kind of its favorites. 
This is one of the lookalikes, as I said before, we have some insects that kind of look similar. This is the white spotted Sawyer. Um, it's not as shiny as, as the Asian longhorn beetle, and there are a lot of other differences. But if you're if you're in doubt, just um, you know, if you see something like this, take a picture of it and send it to us. I don't think that's my last slide, but it doesn't look like it's advancing anymore. Let me see. Oh, here we go. Here's another native beetle that we have that sometimes people mistake for Asian longhorn beetle, but um, the, the big difference is that it has bands instead of dots. This is the banded alder borer. You'll sometimes find this on piles of um, firewood. Um, the next priority pests that I'm gonna talk about are the slugs. Um, here's a long list of slugs that are exotic, not known to occur but are at risk of, of being introduced into Washington. Hi, Yolanda, this is a Foreman Orning. Oh, okay, um, this is a native slug. And I just wanted to show you um, this structure here on a, our native um, banana slug is the mantle. And the exotic slugs that I had in that list that I just showed you, um, they, do, they don't appear to have a mantle. Actually, the mantle is, covers their whole body, but it kind of looks, as you can see, it doesn't look like it has that structure that um, that this banana slug has. So this is the thing to kind of look for if you ever see a slug like this that doesn't appear to have a mantle. It'd be great if you could take a picture of it and um, send it to us. There's some more different um, uh, slugs that are in that same group. Again, you can see it It doesn't appear to have a mantle as our banana slugs and, and the other slugs that we have like the the um, the black slugs and the red slugs also appear to have a mantle, but these do not. This is a giant African snail. Um, it has been introduced into the US in the past in different places. Um, this actually could survive around the Puget Sound. The climate is warm enough for them to survive. And another thing that I um, that I would like to point out is that they do get very large, but they're not always large. So some people think if they find a small snail that it wouldn't be giant African snail, but they do start out very small. So um, it's always something to be on the lookout for. It has been spread around on the pet trade. There's another um, snail, um, Manaka, the two different species of Manaka. I wanted two minutes left. Okay. Um, this is Cernuela Vergata, which was introduced into the Port of Tacoma and is actively under eradication. Um, one thing to point out is that a lot of it, um, invasive species, not just snails, but other invasive species, will have behaviors like this where you'll see a whole bunch of them. You'll see a massing or you'll, you'll see a, a large um, infestation. That's a good sign that it might be exotic. So if you see anything like that, whether it's snails or any other type of pest, um, it would be great if you could take a picture of it and send it to us. And I think I'm not going to have time to go through. These are all um, spotted lanternfly signs, posts. Um, and I just want to mention the do not do not move firewood program. Do not move firewood.com is a great resource. If you've not looked at it, take a look. It has different materials, different activities for kids, um, uh, things that you can print out, posters, and lots of really great information. Um, what to do if you find a suspect invasive pest? Um, if you can capture it, if it's an insect and you can capture it, um, put it in the freezer or just photograph it and make a note of the plant that you found it on. Um, if you can email a picture to me or to your um, WSDA office or your county extension, um, that, would be, that would be great. And here I've put a list of helpful websites that have good information, good pictures. Um, and that's it, does anybody have any questions?